oops, sorry that I can't be with you. Sorry I'm not there in person. Hopefully this recording works well enough and then we can chat over Skype afterwards. So I'm going to be talking about flat-tailed horn lizards and the risk of extinction debt. And this is a topic that I'm no expert in and I've never spoken about, so hopefully it goes well enough. It's just a I kind of was trying to pull back and look at big picture ideas and and that's where I'm coming from. Now, most of you know already that we started working on flat tails in 1996, so technically 21 years ago, um, that we were out on the BMGR, the Yuma Management Area, and doing all sorts of fun stuff, taking temperature and weight and snout vent length and doing telemetry and looking at scats and dietary analysis and predation and pretty much all of our kids were raised doing flat tail work um, which is why the ICC is going to be receiving the bill for their counseling and uh, 2003 got involved pretty heavily in editing the management strategy so it's been a remarkable 20 years here's that first year 1996 field crew You'll recognize this guy, hopefully, Rulin was among the very first and the only one besides us to ever go back to Yuma, apparently. So, good job, Rulin. Uh, Chris helped us, Chris Gerard helped us with a predictive map of habitat or occupancy probability based on some presence absence surveys. That was one of the fun things we did. We got some interesting publications over the years and I just bring these up only to point out that it's because of good co-authors and I have a terrible track record of publishing beyond the reports. I've written a lot of reports but I apologize I need to need to repent get those publications out there. Now a few caveats I don't actually fear that flat tails are going extinct so I'm using the word extinction a lot. Extirpation would be a more appropriate term, but I was reading up on this idea of extinction debt. It resonated with me. It kind of provided the framework for talking about a few things. So, so just clarifying that. Um, also, extinction debt is usually referring to like number, total number of species in an area that that may go extinct over time. Not usually applied to just a single species, but that's how I want to do it. And it's also extinction debts usually looked at uh, with long-lived species, but that's okay. Okay, so what's on my mind? Since day one, we've had problems with detection probability, and that low detection probability really messes us up. It makes for big error margins of error around our population estimates now over time thanks to the statistical gurus uh, this has really been improved upon and we've worked out methods and and so things are better but still we have these pretty wide margins of error combine that with you know wide natural population fluctuations from year to year and I just think we have a pretty small ability to detect declines, especially slow, steady declines that may be happening, especially in areas where we're not doing our monitoring. So that's my bottom line worry, uh, is that you know by necessity, we focus our monitoring efforts in, in places where we can find the lizards, which tends to be better habitat with higher population densities. So we may be overestimating and we may be missing what's going on in places where we're not looking. So what is extinction debt? It's basically extinctions that haven't happened yet, but will happen. So in an area of degraded habitat, you go there, you find 10 species of lizards but this is really poor habitat to have that many species of lizards. You come back later, years later, and now there are two. And it's like, oh. So the debt is those extra eight species that were there. That's the debt that had to get paid. It just took a little while. Um, or, you know, a tree 
species that has lost its pollinators, you know, some mammalian pollinator that got wiped out, um, the tree is still there for a hundred years, even though it's it's a dead tree essentially. It's not it's not reproducing. So anyhow, but the important thing is that there's a time delay between the habitat degradation and the extinction. So that time delay is where we can have some influence, hopefully. We already know that there has been a lot of habitat destruction, you know, before we ever started conserving flat tails, and, and that's done, and, and it's not coming back, most likely, any of it. Um, but how much additional habitat has been lost in the last 20 years during a time when we could have been looking a little more closely? Uh, you know, do we know what's going on with the population here? Do we know what's going on with, you know, the other, there are a lot of places, you know, they're, they're probably still there for the most part, but, uh, you know, all these, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, there's habitat that's been lost pretty recently, really. Now, we know that habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation are really the drivers of these population extinctions, plus pollution, climate change, invasive species, fire, disease, all sorts of other things that can add up. And if we look at flat tail habitat, I wouldn't have guessed 20 years ago that there would be as much new housing construction, as much solar energy development, uh, as many date farms, and new agriculture, and new road construction and continued ATV use. So it's not becoming less impacted, to put it mildly. So just wanted to draw a quick comparison. So we left Yuma a year and a half ago, came to Del Rio, Texas, switched to a new horned lizard. And this is my neighborhood. There's my house. We found Texas horned lizards right in our backyard. And it's just a suburban neighborhood. But I found them here in this empty lot, and here in this empty lot, and here, and here, and here. This is our little campus. I'm broadcasting to you from right here. And right outside my office, I found a horned lizard, Texas horned lizard. So my question is, do we actually have a sustainable, long-term sustainable population here? Or is this, or is there an extinction debt, right? The, the, amount of habitat degradation that has already taken place may be sufficient that 10 years time there will simply be no more horned lizards in this area in in this neighborhood um, even if there wasn't additional construction that will certainly go on okay, that's the idea uh, now in Yuma this is zoomed out so we're not looking at little patches we're looking at big patches but what about over here. What about next to this construction in Foothills area? What about this side of the area service highway over here? What about right here between the highway and the agriculture over here in an area that's pretty isolated? So there are big patches where I don't know if there are, are flat tails there. And I don't, I just don't think it's known. Or, well, when we've looked, we haven't found be honest uh, this is this was a brand new field that had been put in earlier in the year when we sampled and right next to it ta-da fat healthy flat-tailed horn lizard right next to it and there were lots of ants and it was happy critter but I pretty much guarantee you go back there now and you wouldn't find any flat tails why because along comes the agriculture up go the levels of predators they just don't seem to do well flat tails do not seem to do well on in areas where the habitat gets converted now thankfully we have the management areas and that's fantastic we have great big chunks of habitat these meta populations are probably self-sustaining for a very long time and yet Within management areas, are there little patches where the populations have blinked out? What about along the edges? Uh, how much have we lost in 20 years? It's you know it's not known really, but uh, 
but likely we've lost little populations. Hopefully they can come back. But um, looking forward, how much might we lose? How many? How much degradation might still happen along the edges or or within? Different levels where these impacts can be felt. The survival of individuals, of populations, and of metapopulations. At the level of individuals, you can look at eggs, juveniles, adults, and this is going to depend on what are the conditions, biotic and abiotic. And we can say, well, how do we impact this? You know, the low flat tail reproduction, that's not our fault. Uh, but predation, I don't know, we may influence levels of predators. You think about how many more predators there are near agriculture or near town. Most predators, maybe not leopard lizards, but most predators are in higher numbers along the edges of habitat where it meets up with human uses. And certainly those ground squirrels. So when it comes to estimating mortality and that population viability analysis, very interesting. Um, and But we need accurate estimates of mortality for, for that to, to be really useful. And I'm not convinced we have that. We stick that transmitter on, we follow that lizard every day. It stresses the animal. I think that we have a, an artificially high uh, mortality rate when we do that. We assume that hatchling mortality is the highest and that juveniles higher than adults, but we, we just don't have much data and that we're limited by transmitter size, really. So I would like this to be investigated more, so I'm suggesting using scanning harmonic radar uh, as an option. And I've never tried it, so I don't know the limitations, but I read stuff and, you know, if they can stick little tags on bees and beetles and butterflies and they can get movement, you know, 600 meters away and look at these flight paths and everything, why, can, why haven't we already done this? You know, with all the military folks and you know, this is radar, this is cool technology. We should have done this already. So that's something I think we can do. Um, population level. Now, where do you draw the line to say that this is a population and over there's another population? That's tricky, but uh, you can probably think of some local flat tail population extinctions. You're probably aware, you know, next to the Game and Fish office. There used to be flat tails there, probably not anymore. Um, so I would call that a local population extinction. And importantly also, which populations have persisted? Up in Coachella Valley? Man, they, they are very aware of this because very isolated, uh, very threatened populations, but persisting remarkably. So at the population level, anything that's reducing overall reproductive output or increasing overall mortality, uh, that's going to have an impact on that population. And as I keep saying, I think survival rate is quite a bit lower along the edges uh, in the you know along the edge of an impacted area the edge of a good habitat and unfortunately edges may also be attractants okay? agriculture brings irrigation roads bring extra runoff more vegetation means more food for the ants yay we love them we go to the road and squash so these edges can be real sink areas uh, for the population and and decrease the decrease that population so I would love to see work done outside the management areas. We have access to most of these places really, and it's a way for us to identify you know, what are the drivers, what are the biggest drivers of extinction for flat tails? What, what impacts them the most? Is it, and, and you know, can we identify it? Can we practice mitigating? Can we practice restoring habitat? There are things that we can do. We don't have to wait for the threats to come into the management areas. We can go outside where the threats are already there and play around a little bit. I'm not suggesting we try to save all the populations of flat tails. 
I recognize that, you know, this population, it's probably doomed between the agriculture and the highway. It's probably just not going to make it, but what can we learn from it before it goes? Metapopulation level, we're talking about connectivity between populations. And so anything that reduces dispersal ability is going to reduce the rescue and recolonization uh, within that metapopulation. And fragmentation, you know, habitat loss, alteration, roads, canals, agriculture, and so forth. And that loss of connectivity increases vulnerability so that when that drought comes, when that bad year comes or the extra predators or something changes, that population might go out and suddenly nobody to recolonize. So those sink populations can go extinct. Now, unfortunately, there could be a tipping point where we go from most patches occupied to, you know, if, if, if there are lots of patches occupied but they're isolated, they may boom, collapse kind of all at once. You can have metapopulation collapse. Uh, so we need to think about corridors and what we can do to protect them, corridors between management areas, corridors between populations, some corridors we may not be able to, to save. We can think about corridors within management areas sometimes. So, you know, which populations deserve more protection? I don't know. Uh, just a quick note, this is a before and after shot uh, at ISEC West, a solar power plant west of El Centro. And I actually just wanted to focus on the fact that there were a lot of flat tails, a you know, pretty good number of flat tails in this before habitat, which wasn't actually very good habitat. This is what it looked like. This is the before shot. And there's a freeway on one, in, one edge. There's a canal on an, on an edge. And yet... And it used to be agriculture 20 years ago. So it was just an abandoned ag field, but flat tails had recolonized it. Why? Because there was good connectivity on two sides uh, to, to good habitat and good populations. Uh, but it was interesting that it was interesting to see that uh, they had recolonized and seemed to be in pretty good numbers. Um, well, in interest of time, I'm going to skip, skip, and say that there are things that can be done at the different levels. Individual level, captive breeding program, I don't think that's going to help with flat tails. Removing predators, yeah, we could, but that's an ongoing effort. I mean, what are we going to do, shoot squirrels all the time? Um, population level, well, this is where we get into habitat restoration, adaptive management, genetic diversity, um, translocation. So this is more, we, we tend to work with flat tails more at the population, metapopulation level. You know, so constructing new habitat, maybe, you know, that, that ag field that was just left fallow uh, was recolonized. So, so, you know, that's a possibility acquiring new habitat, protecting existing habitat, developing corridors, um, assisting colonization if there's a patch that got isolated but we still think it could sustain a viable population. So that's the metapopulation level. All right, I've got to, got to finish up here. Um, those are just some ideas. It's just a, I was just trying to give a broader view of thinking of, in terms of Let's not be overconfident at any time about the status of the, of the species because what has already happened may yet have an effect that, that we haven't yet measured. And um, some things we can do now, maybe we can get better mortality estimates using that harmonic radar. Maybe we can do site occupancy beyond uh, the management areas or at least along edges and and look at you know instances of of extinction and and then repopulation and work to re preserve corridors and then learn those lessons from Canberros in terms of Coachella Valley because that's a window into the the future of what if you know those are that could happen on a, on a larger scale so hopefully 
that's helpful and interesting, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks.